Hi, I'm Ken Sanders, and this is the Ammo Can Library. I'm here with my old friend Eric Temple, filmmaker and uh, tech support extraordinaire. Without people like Eric, I couldn't do this, because all I know how to do is talk and open my ammo cans. What this program is about is over decades of going on river trips and camping trips, down the Green and the Colorado, sometimes the Lower Canyons, the Rio Grande. Um, I've developed a whole bunch of read-alouts that I just absolutely love to do and I impose on people uh, on the river. So today's episode is going to be on an old, old friend of both Eric's and mine, uh, the late author Edward Abbey, most famous for his classic book, Desert Solitaire, A Season in the Wilderness, and this absurdist comedy romp called The Monkey Wrench Gang. Back in 1985, I commissioned the underground cartoonist, uh, artist extraordinaire Robert Crumb to illustrate a 10th anniversary edition of The Monkey Wrench Gang. And I kept that in print uh, to this very day. My friends at the Fisher Brewery Company here in Salt Lake City, as a fundraiser for Ken Sanders Rare Books and myself, have been issuing a limited series of cans based on the characters and the drawings by Abby and Crumb. And we're doing six different ones. They're selling out immediately. You probably won't be able to buy them by the time you, you watch this, but we will have empty sealed cans available for purchase for collectors because we have very draconian liquor laws here in the state of Utah and it's illegal for me or them or anyone else for that matter to ship beer in Utah. But you can get some empty cans for your non-beer drinkers for the collector in you. I first met Edward Abbey back in the 1970s, probably about a year after Monkey Wrench Gang was published originally. He walked into my old bookstore, The Cosmic Airplane, Books and Records. Uh, it was an old hippie head shop from the 60s that Steve Jones and Sherm Clow had started in the old 9th and 9th district uh, of Salt Lake City. Uh, by 75, 76, we had evolved it into this uh, huge... Uh, I created the bookstore. We had new books, used books, rare books. We had rare comic books. We had metaphysical sections. We had gay and lesbian literature and women's literature at a time when nobody handled that kind of stuff, at least not in Utah. We had everything. We had a gift shop. We had a record shop. We even, and the head shop, moved underground down, down the stairs. Um, it was really, really heady times, and Ed Abbey walked in one day and recognized him. I talked him into signing some books, first editions in the back room, and while he was doing that, I lectured poor Ed on what I thought of the ethics of Hey Duke and Friends uh, littering the Western landscape with uh, beer cans. Ed didn't react to it much. I don't believe that was the first time anybody had ever gotten after him for that. In spite of that beginning, we did go on to become pretty good friends. And throughout the 80s, uh, Ed Abbey introduced me to way more than we can talk about today, to Earth First, the radical environmentalist group. And I met them at the infamous cracking of Glen Canyon Dam in 1981. We had a lot of radical environmental activities over those years. And, and Ed and I would do these river trips down the uh, Green and Colorado Rivers, Cataract Canyon, uh, November's when nobody in those days was down there. Um, it never was meant to just be me and Ed trips, but somehow, one reason or another, nobody else ever came on them. Ed always had more time than I did, so he would uh, he'd go down the river and uh, we'd arrange to rendezvous at Spanish Bottom, right, up, right below the confluence of the Green and the Colorado. And Ed had this stupid piece of crap sport yak injected plastic boat. He, it was not a boat at all. It was a bathtub toy, in my opinion. 
So we would tow that behind my boat and we would uh, run the rapids in, in my boat. And then our friend, Moki Mac, Richard Quist, the legendary Moki Max, uh, would uh, come up off Lake Powell in a little motorboat and uh, tow our sorry asses uh, back to civilizations. We did it, I don't know, half a dozen times and um, don't have time to get into all those stories. But one of them did lead to uh, an essay based on those river trips called River Solitaire. It's in his last collection of essays, and I'm going to read from it, not from that essay, but from the book. Uh, the essay isn't about our river trips, it's about loneliness and the irony of here is a man who is so comfortable in his own skin, preferably to stay out as long as possible in the wilderness alone. And the fact that he claimed, wrongly so, that I didn't show up on time. And that created lone. Any, anyhow, the essay is about loneliness. And I've written a whole essay that, like most things in my life, I've never finished called The Other Side of River Solitaire. But we don't have time to talk about that today either. I am going to read from that book. I'm going to read a few of my favorite Edward Abbey things. Um, Ed's death left a huge, huge hole in a lot of our lives. Um, he's been gone now 31 plus years. He was 62 years old when he died, way too young. And now he'd be in his 90s? Holy crap. Um, I'm happy to report used and new Edward Abbey books still fly off the shelves. Desert Solitaire and the Monkey Ranch Gang lead in the pack, but the rest of the novels, the essays, uh, if you didn't have a chance, uh, a lot of the younger folks buying Ed Abbey these days were born long after he died. But if you want to know who Edward Abbey is, read his books. Or Eric Temple, oh man, Eric, how many years ago did you film A Voice in the Wilderness, a beautiful documentary about Ed, and it's got his friends and uh, folks in it. Uh, I play a role as the demented bibliophile, of, of course, <laughs> and um, has some just really, really great footage of Ed and his old haunts. I highly recommend it as a, a video bio biography, if you will. Uh, we carry all these things at Ken Sanders Rare Books, 268 South, 200 East in downtown Salt Lake City, Utah. Books at KenSandersBooks.com. We do huge amounts in these COVID times of mail order, curbside. You can get the Fisher Beer cans, the Crumb Abbey cans. You can, we got so far, we got the gang and we got the Hey Duke out. Bonnie Abzug is coming up in two weeks. She'll sell out too. She's currently in a vat over at the Fisher Brewery Company. Don't tell Hayduke, you would probably get pretty mad about that. Okay, uh, my ammo cans have grown over the years. Um, I never know what's in them. Uh, old, old friends, falling apart friends. Oh, this is gonna be a good one. We, last summer, uh, Rebel Girl and I, my other, other producer, singer, songwriter, Rebel Girl, we recorded an over-the-top version of Vaughn Short's classic Raging River Lonely Trail, the Floyd's Void poem. Uh, it's not up yet, but hopefully it'll be up in January. Ah, uh, yeah, here's, here's, uh, this is uh, one of Ed's early uh, collections of essays, The Journey Home, Some Words in Defense of the American West, illustrated by Curmudgeon and ex Park Ranger uh, Jim Stiles, that's his uh, cracking of uh, Glen Canyon Dam being cracked and devoured by Lake Powell. The Journey Home was first published in 1977. He dedicated it to his parents. This book is for Mildred Postlewaite Abbey, my wise, enduring, and beautiful mother, and for Paul Revere Abbey, my father, who taught me to hate injustice, to defy the powerful, and to speak for the voiceless. And by God, through his life and his 21 published years, Ed certainly did so. 
this quote at the front that I love. The earth, like the sun, like the air, belongs to everyone and to no one. He doesn't credit it. I assume he made it up. Ed made a lot of stuff up. He was good at that. His first terrible novel, kind of a pastiche of Thomas Wolfe, if you will, was Jonathan Troy, published in 1954. By the time it came out, Ed was already embarrassed by it. He had been at work on The Brave Cowboy, and that was published two years later. Jonathan Troy and The Brave Cowboy are in the original first editions are Ed's two great rarities for collectors. Uh, he had a two-book deal with Dodd Mead. They didn't publish a lot of Jonathan Troy, and it didn't sell. And we'll never know the print run of The Brave Cowboy, but they did as few as they could to fulfill the contract and dump the author and quietly let both books go out of print. To this day, at his request, Jonathan Troy has never been republished. It's got all the seeds and germination of what Ed Abbey would become as a writer. It's got the classical music loving, the flute playing, the, the anarchist, the, the, just the one-eyed man that becomes Jack Burns throughout most of Ed's later fiction. But it's not good writing. Ed was right. The Brave Cowboy, beautiful novel. Kirk Douglas made it into a film called Lonely or the Brave. It came out in 1962, which was also the publication date of Ed's third novel, Fire in the Mountain, which is a hell of a good read as well. And Ron Howard made it into a, like a TV movie or something years ago. Um, so Ed always wanted to be a novelist. That's why I bring all these novels up. Then Black Sun was quite brilliant in a completely different way. His other fiction, well, you know, it's hard to say. Uh, Good News is certainly not my favorite Ed Edward Abbey book. And Hey Duke lives, he only wrote when he was dying because he'd screwed up his insurance policy and he was dying with no insurance and got a big advance from it. He never, if he had lived, he would not have written the sequel to The Monkey Wrench Gang. The Monkey Wrench Gang stands in his fiction and always will. We'll never know. Well, I don't know if I'm going to live long enough to ever see the movie come out. I hope so. <laughs> I'm tired of talking about that subject. So Ed wanted to be the great novelist in The Fool's Progress, his final novel issued in 1988. That was to be, the subtitle was An Honest Novel. That was to be it, and yet New York was just definitely like, silent on it. He, he was wounded by the lack of reaction that he got to the novel. It's really, it's the deepest, most complex novel he ever wrote. It is a novel about himself, his family, and his friends to a certain extent, and it's a good one. And if you haven't read it, read it. If you haven't reread it in a while, I'd suggest that too. But because of Desert Solitaire, he got so mad at that book at one time, he instructed his agent, why do they always want to reprint quotations from Desert Solitaire? He banned it. He said, they have to pick another book. He was like, it was his favorite child, but he put it, put it in the woodshed, so to speak. It, it, it just, one of the things that made him mad about it is he got classified as a naturalist. Ed Abbey hated being a naturalist. Let me, let me, let me, let's let Ed, let's hear Ed. I'm not a naturalist. I never was and never will be a naturalist. I'm not even sure what a naturalist is, except that I'm not one. I'm not even an amateur naturalist. The only Latin I know is omnia vicit amor and in vino veritas. In boyhood, I thought cave canum meant beware the cane. I never studied botany or zoology or ecology or any other branch of natural science. Like most war veterans, I went to college, but mainly because that seemed easier than working. While in school, I majored in philosophy, not biology, and my intellectual heroes were Democritus, who died laughing, laughing at Plato, 
and Bernard Russell, who died fighting, and Lao Tzu, who wrote one small best-selling book, and Beethoven, who will never die. The subject of my master's thesis was politics, the morality of violence. I failed journalism not once but twice. During my long, erratic, seasonal career with the National Park Service, I was employed never as a naturalist, but as a ranger, and sometimes as a fire lookout, the latter role an ideal one for the amateur philosopher. Today, I consider myself a working novelist, one of the few in America who works for a living. My highest ambition is to compose one good, very long novel, The Fat Masterpiece. That accomplished, I shall retire to my hut in the heart of the desert and spend the remainder of my days in meditation contemplating my novel. I hope to become a rock. I plan to return in future incarnation. I plan to return in future incarnations as a large and lazy soaring bird. Edward Abbey, The Journey Home. I'm going to open up animal can number two. Uh, oh, man. Wed Wendell Berry, Mad Farmer. We, we've been there, done that. Never get. I could never get tired of reading Wendell Berry out loud. I can absolutely guarantee you that. Look at all these. Oh, here's, okay, here's one more. This, this is just a kind of late paperback printing of... Uh, Edward Abbey's Desert Solitaire. Arguably, it's his most important book. Now, it's subtitled A Season in the Wilderness. Well, and this is an author's prerogative. Ed Abbey was park ranger for two, three years down 1950s so at what was then uh, Arches National Monument. Um, he writes this narrative as if it's a continuous season. And like any good author, he leaves stuff out and puts things in. Is all of it literally true? Well, I don't know. I wasn't there. I was a little tiny kid running around in a Davy Crockett coonskin hat back in the 1950s. Um, but it's a writer's prerogative. The question I get asked the most over the years did Ed Abbey really kill that rabbit? Ask Ed. Maybe he was trying to provoke you. Ed loved. He loved bad puns and jokes, and he loved to provoke people and make you think. Desert Solitaire, 50 years, more than 50, he wrote it. Uh, in the 50s, it was published in 1968 for the first time at more than 50 years ago. It is, Ed Abbey never, ever wanted any of his books to be Shudder, a classic. To, to Ed Abbey, a classic was a book that everybody talked about and nobody read. Well, Ed, I'm sorry to have to inform you, but all these Decades later, you have written two classics, The Monkey Wrench Gang and Desert Solitaire. But you were wrong. Your books are alive. They live. They're selling better now than they ever did in your lifetime. Neither book could sell out its first printing of 5,000 copies, and both of them have sold in the millions now, and they're still selling. You're reaching an audience that wasn't born when you were alive and people scoop up every used copy and we sell hundreds of new copies of all of your books, especially Des Solitaire and Monkey, every single year. In the original foreword, Ed Abbey has some advice to you. Finally, a word of caution. Do not jump into your automobile next June and rush out to the canyon country hoping to see some of that which I have attempted to evoke in these pages. In the first place, you can't see anything from a car. You've got to get out of the goddamn contraption and walk, better yet, crawl on hands and knees over the sandstone and through the thorn bush and cactus. 
When traces of blood begin to mark your trail, you'll see something, maybe, probably not. In the second place, most of what I write about in this book is already gone or going under fast. This is not a travel guide, but an elegy, a memorial. You're holding a tombstone in your hands, a bloody rock. Don't drop it on your foot. Throw it at something big and glassy. What do you have to lose? Edward Abbey, the introduction, part of the introduction to Desert Solitaire, Season in the Wilderness. Of the 21 books that Edward Abbey wrote in his lifetime, the 1988 a quiet little book of random essays came out called uh, One Life at a Time, Please. Um, it's a real miscellany, but I think it has some of Edward Abbey's finest writings in it. Um, and it's just not very, very well known. Um, here's my old beat up. <clears throat> this one just barely fits in the ammo can. I, I have to tell you, I take much better care of my real books and my real library collection, but, but these books have been going down the river with me for some since the late 70s, early 80s. And as you, I started out with one, I'm up to three ammo cans, starting to overflow that. I'm not sure, it's getting, maybe in my youth I could have handled four ammo cans at one time, but I'm getting old and I, I two, two's about all I can handle now. I'm down to a two ammo can man, if you can imagine. So One Time at a Life, Please, his last collection of essays uh, came out in 1988. It's got some really good ones in here. Free Speech, The Cowboy and His Cow, Arizona, How Big is Big Enough, Theory of Anarchy, Eco Defense, Immigration and Liberal Taboos, Wild Horses, Lake Powell by Houseboat, River Solitaire at Daybreak. Uh, that's the story about our river trip. So it's really a story about loneliness. Um, out There in the Rocks, Big Ben, 40 Years as a Canyoneer, Mr. Crooch, The Remington Studio, The Future of Sex, Nature Love, Sportsman, and I think the single most important essay he ever wrote, A Writer's Credo. Page 161. Yeah, I've got all kinds of things labeled in here. Okay, I'm only going to read, I'm, I'm only going to read to you the, the first bit of it, but I highly encourage you to seek the entire essay out and read it for yourself. It's just, this is what Ed Abbey, this is what all good writers, great writers, are about. A Writer's Credo by Edward Abbey. <laughs> Yikes. Okay, we're ready. A Writer's Credo by Edward Abbey. It is my belief that the writer, the freelance author, should be and must be a critic of the society in which he lives. It is easy enough and always profitable to rail away at national enemies beyond the sea, at foreign powers beyond our borders, and at those within our borders who question the prevailing order. Easy and it pays. Ask the official guardians of Soviet literary morality. But the moral duty of the free writer is to begin his work at home, to be a critic of his own community, his own country, his own government, his own culture. The more freedom a writer possesses, the greater the moral obligation to play the role of critic. If the writer is unwilling to fill this part, then the writer should abandon pretense and find another line of work. Become a shoe repairman, a brain surgeon, a janitor, a cowboy, a nuclear physicist, a bus driver. Where if one fears to speak, there if one must be silent. Far better silence than the written word used to shore up the wrong, the false, the ugly, the evil 
When necessary, the writer must be willing to undertake the dangerous and often ridiculous and sometimes martyr-like role of hero or heroine. That's all I ask of the author, to be a hero, appoint himself a moral leader, wanted or not. I believe that words matter, that writing counts, that poems, essays, and novels in the long run make a difference. If they do not, then in the words of my exemplar, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the writer's work is of no more importance than the barking of village dogs at night. The hack writer, the temporizer, the toady, and the syncopant, the journalistic courtier. And what is a courtier but a male courtesan? All those in the trade who simply go with the flow, who never oppose the rich and powerful, are no more, no are no better in my view than Solzhenitsyn's village dogs. The dogs bark, the caravan moves on. A Writer's Credo by Edward Abbey. We could go on for hours and hours just about my late friend Ed Edward Abbey alone. We've barely begun to scratch the surface, but we'll, we'll revisit him again because Ed's got a heck of a lot more to say and so do I. But let's, in, in closing, um, just give you a little bit more flavor. <clears throat> oh, yes, more authors. Oh, ma'am, we're going to do an E coming show one of these days. Oh, boy, that's going to be a fun one. All right. This is uh, Edward Abbey's uh, quotation book, A Voice Crying in the wilderness. Edward Abbey, the wilderness needs no defense, only more defenders. Growth for the sake of growth is the ideology of the cancer cell. Some of my favorite EA quotes. Uh, Ed, he wasn't a great artist, but Ed actually illustrated this little volume himself. Um, kind of interesting. I think you made a better writer, Ed, <laughs> an artist. Ed, Ed once did a poetry reading down at the University of Arizona where, where he was teaching, and he read his erotic love poems <laughs> <clears throat> by two or three poems in he had emptied the house. There was only one or two people even left in the audience. Didn't stop him, though. <laughs> the absurd vanity of metaphysicians who like to imagine that they create the world by thinking about it. This world may be only an illusion, but it's the only illusion we've got. Is a mirage real? Well, it's a real mirage. There is science, logic, reason. There is thought verified by experience. And then there's California. Humility is a, view, a virtue when you have no other. Beware of the man who has no enemies. Of all bores, the worst is the sparkling bore. There's nothing so obscene and depressing as an American Christmas and his endless juvenile love of bad jokes and puns. Forgive me for this one. Farting is such sweet sorrow. Oh. A patriot must always be ready to defend his country against his government. The distrust of wit is the beginning of tyranny. All forms of government are pernicious, including good government. All governments require enemy governments. The best cure for the ills of democracy is more democracy. If guns are outlawed, only the government will have guns. 
Society is like a stew. If you don't keep it stirred up, you get a lot of scum on top. No tyranny is so irksome as petty tyranny. The officious demands of policemen, government clerks, and electromechanical gadgets. The nuclear bomb took all the fun out of war. Have a nice day, said Lady Macbeth. Freedom begins between the ears. Truth is always the enemy of power, and power the enemy of truth. Yeah, that gives you a flavor. The most common form of terrorism in the United States of America is that carried on by bulldozers and chainsaws. All gold is fool's gold. Everyone should learn a manual trade. It's never too late to make an honest living. We barely scratched the surface of the one late great Edward Abbey. Uh, we'll revisit him another time. This is Ken Sanders. This has been Ammo Can Library. <laughs>